Welcome back to 60 Plus. Previously, we've discussed the gameplay of The Last of Us Part 2. Now it's time to jump into a spoiler-filled discussion of the story. I'll be discussing the plot of both games here, so if you're not caught up, here's fair warning. For me though, there is no larger spoiler to Part 1 than the simple existence of Part 2, and for such a narratively heavy game, that's really unfortunate. There are numerous twists and turns that simply just don't work anymore. For example, the cliffhanger at the very end of the game is robbed of all drama. Now, instead of ending the game with shock, disbelief, and the frustration that Joel would lie about the fireflies, it ends with a whimper because the knowledge of a second part means that a confrontation is inevitable and not impossible. That being said, the parts of the story that still work do so because significant portions of time pass. Not only that, part one was a journey of a game. After the inciting incident, the story started in Boston, headed to the outskirts of the city, then Pittsburgh, all the way to Jackson, then Colorado, and finally Salt Lake City. The variety of locations led to a diversity of environmental stories and helped keep a driving pace. Part two, on the other hand, is quite a bit different. There is a short memorial after the inciting incident before spending the next 20 hours parked in Seattle. The individual locations often just rotated between coffee shops, office buildings, and apartments before returning back to the theater. It was cyclical, repetitious, and quickly became monotonous. The larger issue than player fatigue and locale, though, is the lack of variety in the secondary stories that are able to be told. In fact, off the top of my head, literally the only environmental story scenario that comes to mind after stepping away from the game for several weeks is the bank heist gone wrong. Contrasted with the first game, where many still come to mind. But for what the game gets wrong in its non-verbal storytelling, it more than makes up for with its character interactions, with one scene in particular leading the charge. Ellie's birthday was a fantastic combination of endearing dialogue, character growth, and just the right amount of fan service layered in. Oh my god, it is a dinosaur! And it is. It was absolutely my favorite scene, and it was a joy to see what Joel and Ellie's relationship had grown into. Did you know this was here? Oh, you don't like it. Um, we can head back. Yeah. Oh, shut up. It's one of the few feel-good moments in the game, and gave the highs necessary for the low lows of the ending to actually work. In fact, when the credits rolled, I don't know of a better term to explain how I felt other than shell-shocked. I sat there, taking in the entire credit sequence, just listening to the music, trying to come to grips with what had just transpired. The last few hours of the game were emotionally draining, incredibly bittersweet, and some of the best media, bar none, that I've ever experienced. When Ellie yelled at Joel, my heart broke, learning that the last words that Ellie ever said to him were hurtful. Then, learning that wasn't their last interaction, as we watched them find common ground again, and promised to make attempts at bettering their relationship, my heart swelled, yet simultaneously ached, knowing what was to come. Wandering the homestead, and seeing Ellie and Dina living out their lives gave me satisfaction that the characters I love could find peace. And then, as Ellie returns from her trip to California, and the house is in disrepair, and Dina and JJ are gone, I physically hurt. The worn look of the home showed just how long Ellie had been gone for. The emptiness of everything wordlessly showed how much the journey had cost. And when it was shown that Ellie couldn't even play guitar anymore, her strongest connection to Joel it became clear that her obsession with revenge led to one of her deepest fears. I'm scared of ending up alone. And it was powerful. What makes these final hours the most fascinating to me though, is that had you told me even more than halfway through the game that I would have this reaction to the end of it, I don't know that I would have believed you. Sure, I was drawn in by the story and constantly frustrated by the decisions of the characters, but I wouldn't say I was hugely invested. A turning point for me though, happened when Ellie and Dina are shown at their homestead. We've spent the whole game wanting better for them, and now they've finally achieved a happy life. There was even a moment where Ellie walked out to the tractor and took a seat, and just for a second, I honestly felt that the game would end there. It would have been a happy ending, though not necessarily a memorable one. Having that experience and that relief, along with a sense of comfort after so many hours of unpleasantness, was necessary for the real ending to truly deliver. The way this game ended reminded me in a huge way of the way that the Lord of the Rings trilogy ended, just like Return of the King, 
It felt like the story was over many times before it actually was, but in the end, the conclusion that they went with, in hindsight, was really the only option. The similarities go on from there. Frodo returned to the Shire after his journey a changed person. He lost part of himself on the road, and that prevented him from being able to live a normal life. His journey to the Grey Havens was him accepting his fate, safe in the knowledge that he was able to provide a better future for those who succeeded him. For me, Lord of the Rings is one of my absolute favorite stories. It means more to me than I can accurately articulate. The fact that Ellie's ending is remarkably similar, and equally bittersweet, hit me hard. It single-handedly changed my overall opinion of the entire game, and has caused me to recommend experiencing it to numerous non-gamers in my real life. But, The Last of Us Part 2 would perhaps more aptly be titled The Last of Us Two Parts, because there's a large portion of the game we haven't even touched on yet. And that's because Abby as a character did not land for me at all. She fills the same role in this game as Joel did in the first one, in that she experiences character growth predominantly through being a mentor, yet I failed to have any sort of emotional connection with her. She just unfortunately has too few redeeming qualities, and the negative karma she earns in the player's eyes for being the one responsible for the gruesome death of Joel proved, at least for me, too much of a deficit to overcome. I don't hate her, but saving a zebra, and then later Yara and Lev, didn't do enough to make her endearing. In the first game, there were little moments between Joel and Ellie that went a long way to developing them and their relationship. Ellie tries to whistle, and through a passage of time, we see her progress and become more successful at it. Joel is hard-edged and won't open up to her about anything. Fast forward some time, we hear Ellie asking him to clarify the rules of football to her. And if you clear the 10 yards, then you're back in first down? First down, that's right. This off-screen storytelling tells us way more about Joel and Ellie than the fact that she simply had questions about a game. It's a bit of a narrative shortcut, but it demonstrated that they'd opened up to each other in the moments in between scenes and were finding ways to connect. It required time to have passed, and not enough time passes in the bulk of part two for there to be any sort of realistic character change or growth in Abby. I don't really want to talk about what the game isn't, or what the game could have been for too long, as I think focusing on what the game actually is, is the best. But hear me out. Picture an alternate universe version of The Last of Us Part Two, one where you don't play as Ellie, where things don't pick up right at the end of the first game. Instead, in this version, you play as brand new characters during the same time period of the first game. You're given hours to build an attachment and get to know these characters in a meaningful way, the same way you were with Joel and Ellie. In a twist, the game culminates and ends in the same hospital where Joel kills the doctor to save Ellie in part one. Joel kills your father, who you've just had the experience as a player of bonding with through this journey, and then the game ends. The shock you would feel as a player at that point would be palpable. You personally would feel a sense of betrayal, knowing that you, as the player in part one, killed your new favorite character's father. Part three would come out several years later, and would be almost identical to what we received as part two. Abby's transformation to being absolutely ripped would have had shock. Joel's death would have been perhaps more predictable, but as a player, the feeling would have been much more conflicted. You'd have been happy for Abby, and heartbroken for Ellie. Then, the game of cat and mouse that happens would have had much more of a thrust throughout the entire game, and not just the first half. To be clear, I'm not suggesting I'm a better storyteller than those at Naughty Dog, nor am I saying that the game has poor writing or anything of the sort. In fact, I commend them for taking on the incredible challenge of trying to make an unlikable character sympathetic. It didn't work for me, but that doesn't mean it was ill-conceived. I just think more needed to be done for Abby to be as endearing as Joel and Ellie were in the first part and I'm sad that that didn't happen. Now, I've heard people level the complaint against this game, calling it emotionally manipulative. My response to that is, of course it is. All media is designed to be emotionally manipulative. In my mind, the mark of whether or not a game or movie or album or whatever is successful is whether or not the artist was actually able to convey the emotion they intended. Gameplay-wise, I too frequently felt bored or frustrated to really say they nailed this one. And for most games, that would be a death sentence in my book. However, the impact of Ellie's story and the intense, prolonged emotions it gave me will make this go down as an all-time favorite. That being said, my long-term impressions will be dependent on where the story goes from here, or more accurately, doesn't. Part 1 ends on a cliffhanger 
that is completely dependent on not knowing what happens next. Part 2 opens with a handing off of the protagonist position from Joel to Ellie. It's even symbolized through the guitar that Joel gives Ellie. The game ends with Ellie putting down the guitar while she ventures out into the world. I can only hope that the correct interpretation of that is that Ellie is ending her involvement with the narrative in this world because continuing her story any further would be a tragedy. Maybe not for Ellie herself, but for one of my favorite stories ever. Thank you so much for watching. I seriously appreciate the support.